At the beginning of the first Iron Man movie, Tony Stark wins an award, but he unexpectedly doesn't show up to receive it. His friend and colleague, Obadiah, graciously accepts the award on his behalf and excuses his absence by saying, the best thing about Tony is also the worst thing. He's always working. And so it is with stories. The best thing about them is also the worst thing. They have tremendous power. The same power they have to promote truth and love can also be used to promote lies and hatred. For the past several years, I've been researching a personality typing system called the Enneagram, which has primarily grown in popularity through stories. It has a mysterious ancient origin story that creates a feeling of transcendence and credibility, even though one of the creators of it admitted to making this up. Those who use it tell inspirational stories of success and growth, how it helped them understand themselves and others, how it saved their marriage, helped them improve their leadership ability, and for some, how it helped them connect with God. Now the question for the Enneagram is despite the inspirational stories, is it true? Just because something is tr tells an inspirational story does, or works doesn't mean it's true. On Christopher Columbus's final voyage across the Atlantic, he became stranded in Jamaica. His crew was running out of supplies and desperate to get home, he came up with a devious plan because the locals stopped trading with them. He had an almanac that told of an upcoming lunar eclipse. And so he told the locals that God was angry with them for not helping and he would cover the moon in his wrath. When the eclipse started, he locked himself in his room to time the eclipse so he could figure out the precise location. Meanwhile, the locals frantically started gathering supplies. At the peak of the eclipse, he emerged, saying that God had forgiven them and would allow the moon to return to normal. Columbus was able to do this, determine their location, and know of the eclipse from a 30-year-old book that was published 100 years before Copernicus, Copernic, Copernicus figured out that the, the sun, not the earth, is the center of the solar system and almost 150 years before Galileo helped make that view widespread with observations made from a telescope. Now, the geocentric model of the universe worked, and it worked well, but it wasn't true, and still isn't true. Likewise, with the Enneagram, we have to ask, is it true? There are countless stories throughout history of people refusing to accept new data or change their beliefs because they bought into false stories. Is the Enneagram one of those? Does it obscure truth or does it reveal truth? Now, the Enneagram claims that there are nine personality types and everyone in the world has one and only one dominant type that never changes. It also adds in a layer of complexity by setting the types in a specified order around a circle that defines the relationship between types and prescribes a path for growth. Now we can test these claims through a variety of methods, primarily using reason, and my personal favorite, with data. Now right off the bat, it raises a red flag by using personality types. Psychologists pretty much ever measure everything on a continuous scale because it leads to more accuracy. Let's take the trait of extroversion. If we have two people that score right near the middle, they're gonna act very similar to each other in many ways, at least as it relates to extroversion. But when we categorize them into types and call them an introvert and extrovert, we lose accuracy. Moreover, most people actually tend to score toward the middle on personality traits and our scores tend to fluctuate a little bit over time and across situations. The Enneagram loses accuracy by categorizing people into types and conflicts with the research showing that personality does indeed change. Strike one. Another way we can evaluate the Enneagram is through explanatory power. The big five is by far the dominant view of personality among scientists. 
It was developed when two psychologists went through every word in an English dictionary and found 18,000 words that they identified could be used as a personality description. They further reduced that to 4,500 words, which they thought were likely personality descriptors. Other researchers refined and extended their work by collecting actual data from participants. And through a statistical technique called factor analysis, which looks for correlations between different variables, they were able to determine that personality can largely be defined by five big traits, which are called the big five. Any personality system that attempts to make grand claims about humans needs to at least account for the big five, if not more. However, the Enneagram only shows limited correlations with the big five. Take, for example, Enneagram type ones. Type one scores consistently correlate with extroversion and conscientiousness, but not the three other traits. So if you're an Enneagram type one, you're probably fairly high on extroversion and conscientiousness, but not primarily because it's only correlational. Moreover, it tells you nothing about your level of agreeableness, emotionality, or openness. The Enneagram offers a limited perspective on personality, and it fails to account for the vast amounts of data we've accumulated in personality science over the last 50 years. The last area I'll mention is, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, iterator reliability. Now, you can determine your Enneagram type by reading descriptions of the types and determining which one best describes you. You can do it by taking a test, often online, or by talking to someone who knows both you and the Enneagram. If the Enneagram is correctly identifying consistent personality traits, there should be a high level of agreement between these different methods or between different experts. However, it's common practice in many Enneagram resources to include a guide to mistyping because people get their types wrong so frequently. Moreover, the scientific research that has compared two different typing methods or experts also typically finds low agreements between different types and between different experts. It's just not consistent. Strike three. There are many other ways the Enneagram has been tested and failed, but at this point, the bigger question is why does the Enneagram seem so wonderful to some people? if it's not actually accurate. This question was first answered over 70 years ago. After World War II, it became big business to sell personality tests to companies looking to make a profit and a competitive edge. Listen to this description of a personality salesman from a 1950s article. A common device of the high-pressure salesman who is dispensing a fake line of psychological tests runs something like this. Statistics can be used to prove every, anything. Let me give you a real demonstration. You take this personality test yourself, and I'll give you the report based on your scores. And if you don't agree that the results are amazingly accurate, I won't even try to sell it to you. The gullible personality manager takes the test, reads the report, and is amazed by the accuracy, and spends a whole lot of his company's money for a device not worth the paper and printing. So why would this fake test or these invalid tests feel accurate? The psychologist Bertram Forer came up with a clever test to find out why. He gave his students a personality test and then asked them to rate the results. Nearly all of them said the results were very accurate, but there was a catch. He gave them all the same result. He came up with this personality description based on an astrology book, and it used broad, universally valid statements that described nearly everyone. Yet the students all said that it was highly reflective of them. Several scientists followed up with this test and observed the same effect, which became dubbed the Barnum effect. These broad, universally valid statements make us feel like it's accurate, make us feel seen and heard. But this collection of broad general statements really describes everyone. Moreover, when people use the Enneagram, they typically reflect on their personality and talk about it with trusted others. 
further giving the impression that the Enneagram is accurate when it's not. Unfortunately, people keep telling stories and using the Enneagram and promoting it further and further and further. And since I've started writing about the Enneagram, many people have confessed to me stories of harm the Enneagram has caused. I've heard stories of people ending relationships, and in one case, a divorce. People not getting hired for a job because they were the wrong type. Others being pushed out of their church or organization because they expressed dissent about the Enneagram. A common way people use it negatively is through stereotyping in ways that are no better than racist or sexist stereotypes. I did a survey on the Enneagram for my book, and among people who have never used the Enneagram, 58% said they've seen it used for stereotyping. Among those who use the Enneagram, 67% said that they've seen it used that way, some admitting to doing it themselves. From our limited perspective on Earth, it seems like the sun is moving around the Earth. But we can use reason to consider a wider range of evidence to know that it's not. From our limited perspective, it might seem like the Enneagram is very accurate and representative of us, but we can use a wider range of evidence to realize that it's not. Now, the Enneagram is just the area of research I've fallen into, but it lends itself to a bigger point. How can we make, hope to make progress as a society if we can't even use reason and evidence for a simple personality test? when we have much bigger issues to think about. Thank you.